Today I'm going to be taking a look at a somewhat rare, controversial, and often misunderstood chip, Intel's i487SX, a quote-unquote math coprocessor released back in 1991. But in order to understand the i487's rather strange place in history, we're going to need to take a look at math coprocessors in the more traditional sense, and especially Intel's previous 386 generation. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the mathematical side of things, but you can basically think of float point as a very efficient way of representing numbers with decimals. A float point number is broken into two parts, a significant digit and an exponent, and these can be used to represent very large and very small values using a much smaller number of bits. Any x86 CPU can handle arithmetic of numbers with decimals. It's one of its basic functions after all, but not when they're represented in this way, at least not without doing very inefficient and slow software emulation. And that's where a hardware float point unit or math coprocessor comes into play. The majority of applications in the 80s and early 90s simply didn't use float point math, really wasn't necessary, and very few people had a coprocessor to see any benefit from it anyway. So in those days it was mainly used in some very specific use cases, especially in computer-aided design or CAD, spreadsheets, as well as a number of scientific applications, and that was just due to the nature of how these programs worked and the math that was required for them to do their jobs. Most 3D6 motherboards had two sockets, one for the CPU and one for a discrete math coprocessor. Intel's i387 was a popular choice, but there were many competitors out there too. Because this is an external chip, it has to communicate with the CPU using the external data bus, which is not the most efficient way of doing things. And this is where one of the new features of the next generation 486 would really shine. The 486DX was the first Intel CPU to have an on-die float point unit, and having it on the CPU die itself meant that it ran much more efficiently and didn't need to wait for the external data bus. This move from Intel was also kind of interesting because it was sort of a sign of the times. Float point math was becoming more useful in the mainstream and would eventually become commonplace in things like 3D gaming, for example. But this Ondai FPU was found only in the 486DX series. The more budget-oriented 486SX that came out in 1991 still had many of the great 486 features like Ondai L1 cache, but it lacked an FPU. So the i487 must obviously be an updated FPU that's designed to work with 486SX chips, isn't it? Well, kind of, <laughs> not really. So before we move on, let's take a look at what the 487 is in Intel's own words, and what better place to look than the retail box itself. Thankfully, CPU Galaxy has a few photos of this, and I will include a link to his site and YouTube channel in the description below, so be sure to check him out. The resolution's pretty low on this photo, but I'll read it out here. The fastest math coprocessor. The Intel 487SX math coprocessor delivers up to 40% better performance than the Intel 387DX. Save valuable time when running spreadsheets, graphics, accounting, etc, etc. All well and good. Moving on to the next paragraph. Yeah, this one is... <laughs> and I quote... Use the Intel i487SX math coprocessor designed to work side by side with your Intel 486SX microprocessor. It is your guarantee of a matched pair with perfect compatibility. <laughs> Although Intel calls the i487 a math coprocessor, it is literally a fully functional 486DX series CPU with the same instruction core and on die FPU, just with a slightly different pinout, which I'll get more into later. There are many misconceptions out there about how the i47SX works, and clearly Intel's marketing did not help. But to put it simply, it does not work alongside the original CPU, it actually needs to be disabled, and the i47 will take over all of the processing duties in the system. Intel certainly could have allowed an i 387 style FPU that uses the external data bus, but that combo would have been at a pretty serious performance disadvantage compared to a DX with an on-die FPU. And I suspect this was the reason they didn't want to go down that road. And I'm sure the 40% performance improvement over the 387 comes down mainly to this. So why on earth would you buy a second full-blown CPU to pair up with your 486SX? Wouldn't it just make more sense to buy a DX series CPU and sell the SX? Well, if it could be removed, Yes, that would make a lot more sense, but on many budget boards in the early 90s, the SX CPU was soldered on and couldn't be removed. 
So if you watch the last couple of videos I did, this was the secret purpose of the FIC 486 VCHD. This is exactly the type of board that the i487 was intended for. As you can see, it has an upgrade socket right next to the SX chip, but on this particular board, both the i487 and a standard DX Series 486 are supported here, which kind of begs the question, what was really the point of the i487? Anyway, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but let's take a closer look at this chip first. As you can see, it's the same size and shape as a ceramic top 486 CPU. No surprise there, given what it is. This one has a stepping code of SZ494, which seems to be the only one that I've seen out there for the i487. One thing you'll notice is that it lacks any kind of megahertz rating printed on the chip, but according to the data book, it's rated for up to 25 megahertz operation. It was probably just easier to have a single model that was meant to be used with all of the initial release versions of the 46SX. So that's the 16, 20, and 25 megahertz models. Now, if we flip this over and take a look at the pins, you'll notice that there's an extra one on the i487. It's got 169 pins compared to the standard 168 on a 486. The extra pins located right here in the corner. Now, I've seen some incorrect information circulating online about this 169th pin. People have said that it's used for disabling the onboard 486, but if you refer to the data sheet, you'll see that it's actually just labeled as a key pin and it's not connected to anything at all. It has no significance other than to prevent the CPU from being installed the wrong way in the socket. Now, although that extra pin isn't used for disabling the 486, there is a different pin used for that purpose. It's pin B14 pin that exists on all 486s, but is normally not connected. It's called the MP pin, which stands for math present, and Intel later renamed it to the UP pin, or upgrade present. With an i487, that pin is always driven low. Now, some people have speculated that it's the motherboard responsible for detecting the i487 using this pin, and then it somehow disables the 486, but this isn't totally correct. Pin B14 on the i487 is routed directly to a different pin on the 486 processor. It's connected to pin C11, a control input that exists on all 486 CPUs. When that pin is pulled low on the 486, it will quote unquote tri-state all of its output pins and put itself into a power down mode. When Intel says tri-state, they're basically just referring to the third state a pin can be in a high impedance mode that's neither high nor low, essentially disconnecting the pins from the circuit. If none of the outputs are connected, there's really no way it can interfere with the i487. In the case of the FIC486 VCHD, adding the i487 is almost a jumperless exercise. Although there are specific jumper settings for an SX, a DX, and an i487, the only jumper that really seems to matter is one called JC4. According to the manual, this needs to be closed whenever there are two CPUs installed in the system. If I don't close JC4, the system will just hang at post. In theory, this shouldn't be necessary with the way the i487 works. I don't know about you, but it always bothers me when there's a critical jumper with a pretty vague description. I really wanted to know exactly what this jumper did, so I broke out the multimeter and I started tracing it. I confirmed one side is ground. Then I was able to quickly locate the other side on the onboard 486. It goes to the ninth pin from the corner, which is pin 156. This is the equivalent to pin C11 on PGA chips, the same pin used to disable the processor. So when the jumper's closed, that pin gets grounded, pulling it low, sort of simulating the presence of an i487, even if one isn't there. Now FIC did this because regular 168 pin DX processors are also supported on this board. And since they don't use the MP or UP pin, a manual method was needed to disable the onboard 486. But the i487 isn't the only chip that uses this slightly different pinout. Here's another example. This is the ODP version of Intel's DX266 overdrive. It's 169 pins with the same key and upgrade present pin. But unlike the ODP R chips, are standing for replacement. ODP chips are designed to be installed in a second upgrade socket while the original CPU remains in the system, just like the i487. I do have one other system here that has the same 169 pin upgrade socket. This is the DEC PC433 DXLP. With this system, no jumpers are required. If I remove the ODP processor, the 33 megahertz CPU runs normally. And if I install the DX266, it takes over and works just fine. 
but if I install a regular 486 in the upgrade socket, this system doesn't post, and that's because it relies on the UP pin to disable the original CPU. Intel claims the disabled 486 should be in a powered down mode, which reduces its power consumption. Now I assume this is not quite the same as cutting all power to the chip, so I got out my thermal camera to take a look. To my surprise, wasn't even warm to the touch, and as you can see, it's about the same temperature as the PCB surrounding it. If I open JC4, both chips are alive and conflicting with each other, and both get warm very quickly. So during post, the system detects a 486DX or 487SX. Ironically enough, it can't really distinguish between the two because they're pretty much the same. <laughs> but it is clearly working because the landmark speed test is now able to give us an FPU performance rating. With the SX, it just didn't report anything at all. I'm not going to get too much into the software side of things here. I don't think anyone would be too interested in seeing some legacy CAD or spreadsheet apps, but just for fun, let's take a look at a game from this period that could actually take advantage of an FPU. And no, I am not talking about Quake. <laughs> really don't recommend running it on anything less than a Pentium for obvious reasons, but the fact that it runs it all on the i47 tells us we have a working FPU crunching away at float point arithmetic. The game would not even launch otherwise. But let's take a look at a game that came out five years earlier in 1991. This is Falcon 3.0. It's an F-16 flight simulator game. Never played this one back in the day, but it is one of the few games from the early 90s that can actually take advantage of a math coprocessor. Falcon 3.0 has several different flight modes, and these modes determine just how realistically the plane will handle in the game. There are several different settings, and each of these will introduce forces like lift, drag, and will change roll rate, things like that. But there is a special setting called high fidelity, and the game will only allow you to enable it if a math coprocessor is detected. The makers of the game claim that this mode is based on a real F-16 flight simulator that's used by the military, so it's as realistic as possible, and obviously it required some float point math to be able to make that work. And of course, it wouldn't be one of my videos without trying to overclock something. As I showed in my last video, the onboard 486SX is a total beast and can achieve a 100% overclock. The i487 couldn't quite match the onboard chip, but it still achieved a very impressive 40 MHz clock speed for a 60% overclock. And there you have it. Very strange bit of history from Intel here. Being able to upgrade though was always a big deal in those days and having that upgrade socket probably made some buyers feel better about the hobbled 486SX as if it could be made whole again with a simple addition in the future. Intel was happy to give consumers that option with something that resembled an FPU in the traditional sense, at least on the surface anyway. But with a price of 449 US dollars in 1992, certainly wasn't priced like a traditional FPU, but rather the complete CPU that it really was. The DX33 was about the same cost and was rated at a higher frequency too, so unless you had a soldered on SX or a board that just really couldn't take a DX in the upgrade socket, it really didn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's probably why the 487 was not long for this world. Intel began to move away from soldered on chips and consumer systems, and instead focused on their 486 overdrive replacement models instead. Much better strategy since the old CPU doesn't go to waste and can be sold or traded in. Anyway, love to hear what you think about this chip, so please leave a comment down below, especially if you happen to use one or know someone who did. But that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoy my channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You'll find more information and useful links in the description below. Thanks again.